Welcome to Joint Effort with Des Moines Orthopedic Surgeons. This podcast covers the pain and injuries that are associated with muscles, ligaments, and joints. Welcome to Joint Effort. Uh, I'm your host, uh, Jason Sullivan with uh, Des Moines Orthopedic Surgeons. Today we have an esteemed guest, John Klein. He's an MD anesthesiologist. Um, I work closely with him. And uh, you are the first doc on the show, non-orthopedist or podiatrist. So it's quite a feat. Yeah, feel pretty good about that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I think you should. Yeah. This is a pretty big deal. Pretty, you know, pretty big feel opportunity for a guy like here. you. Feel honored to be here. Uh, so John and I go way back, uh, probably about seven years or so now when you moved back from, you were in Texas at the time. Yep. Um, but you're from Iowa originally. And how does someone figure out they want to do anesthesia? Like, w- do you go to med school and then you're like, I like this? Or um, are you like, I can't do clinic? You know, I just want to be in the OR. How, did, how does a guy like you figure that yeah, out? Yeah, I think uh, that's an interesting question because it's, it's not a field you necessarily get exposed to a lot. Um, and uh, even in med school. So um, going into med school, I thought I wanted to be an orthopedic surgeon, actually. Uh, then actually was all the way up to my fourth year and then actually did an elective rotation in anesthesia and really liked it. And I had an uncle and a cousin who were both anesthesiologists um, kind of talked to me more about it. But um, so it's, yeah, it's a, it's, it's a good field, but not one you have a whole lot of exposure to until further along in med school. Right. So, Didn't you also do critical care? I did a fellowship in critical care you after did. anesthesia. After so anesthesia. that was actually what intrigued me. I like taking care of, like, I like being in the ICU, I like taking critical care patients. So doing an anesthesia residency is one of the pathways you can get to do a fellowship in critical care. So that's kind of what drew me into anesthesia partly as well. And then thinking that would be my ultimate thing and that I would just do critical care, do ICU stuff. Um, after doing my fellowship, um, I realized that I kind of like being, <laughs> being in the OR a lot more than. Than in the ICU? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, just more reproducible environment um, is critical care just um, pretty demanding isn't it yeah, so I mean the the, uh, the OR is usually, you know not necessarily all the time for the patients is not a fun place but for the you know there's a lot of you know you have conversations and stuff in the OR or, yeah um, I like you know you're <coughs> finishing a task like start to finish so you're done with it um, whereas in the ICU sometimes you know your patients are there a long time you're getting called throughout the night and you know and having those some of the difficult conversations with the family um so those are some of the things that kind of drew me back you actually uh uh trained under uh you were i think an intern on a, under one of our buddies and you got coined the name johnny knowledge uh one of the first stories i heard about you you were uh i don't know if you're an intern or med student but there was someone who wasn't doing too well in the icu and um uh, uh, they kind of put you on the case because they knew you're uh, astute and could kind of sort some things out. I don't out. think they put me on the case. I think I was the only guy in there in the hospital overnight. Well, it just happened to be me what, on the call that night. Whatever it may have been, it, it sounds like, you know, they were almost, uh, you know, a palliative care scenario. But the story goes that um, the next morning, a uh, senior resident comes in for rounds and, and the, the patient was nearing coming off the vent and everything because you spent your entire time. <laughs> and I, I believe that you tirelessly spent time on this patient because I've met you and you just grind over the, 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 the details. And uh, that, that's what makes you a good doc. I think that story is probably a little bit glor- <laughs> glorified. I yeah. think the patient was probably just getting better on his own, but maybe and I happen to be the guy I, in, in the hospital that I, night. I choose to believe the other route, to be honest with you, um, because I've uh, I've played hoops with you, I've worked out with you, I've been in the OR with you, and and uh, you don't leave much uh, to chance, to be honest, uh, including youth basketball, which I feel badly for your kids. Not I many, do too. I feel bad for not many, So you walked on at Creighton and played basketball. <laughs> are you not giving yourself credit for this? Do you not have a varsity letter? Or? No, I, I was on the team. You're you know, on the I, team. I Did you start a few games? Uh, I think I started two games, you know, in my four-year career. Okay. So um, Were you the yeah. practice guy that they're like, just chill out, man, relax a little bit? No, you know, I, I wanted to go to Creighton for uh, school, and uh, Coach Allman gave me the opportunity to still play basketball. So, and it was fun. I met a lot of great guys, had a really good experience. So You had a pretty yeah. good team, too. We had a, yeah, had a really good team. Uh, Did you go Sweet 16? No, we, you know, unfortunately – we did the tournament three times. Uh, only made it past the first round once, we got, but we got beaten the second round. Okay. And but, uh, sadly, uh, your children have taken up one of your hobbies in basketball. Not sadly. They're really good yeah, athletes, yeah. but I worry about them because you coach all three of them. Yeah. Not, not many people have time to coach one of their kids. You coach all three. 
Yeah, I don't know if they yeah, – maybe extent. force a little bit that they play and then unfortunately have to play for me. But uh, but they like playing, I think, um, and, I, and I like coaching. So Yeah, watch out for your kids in the future. I think that you got some college athletes mm-hmm. there. And, but uh, you definitely have a knack for coaching uh, youth sports and you have a good perspective on things. Um, another interesting thing – uh, about you is and you and I actually kind of got into a verbal altercation about it not not an altercation but you were kind of a hero you went out to Manhattan during this COVID crisis in April uh, yeah her, heroes I know you strong, don't, I, hero's a pretty I, strong hey, word if you look I know I know two people that did that from the city of Des Moines you were one of them so at least you're in the minority in a decision that looked like a humanitarian type of decision yeah, at the time we were I was hoping to go out there and you know I thought that would you know, at the time they were thinking they needed a lot of ICU type care, you know, so I was hoping or and kind of thought going out there we might be uh, running like an ICU myself. Um, and uh, fortunately, you know, things were better than um, by the time that we got out there, they're better than better what, off as far from a staffing standpoint than what, you know, anticipated. What, so, what was it? Just give us an example. How long were you there for? Just a week. Planned to be out there two weeks, but yeah. after the day I showed up, there was three anesthesiologists from New York that showed up and a where, couple where of military did you stay? guys. Uh, we, they, I stayed in a hotel, and then I was at Harlem Hospital in uh, New York City. When so. you got off shift, the city was, from what I understand, completely closed down. How do you even get something to eat at that point? <laughs> we had to. Uh, they had some places that were still doing takeout, so call and get takeout, and then had to walk like um, just walk, and yeah. go get it. But did, the city was pretty shut down. I mean, being on Manhattan with you know, virtually no cars except for, uh, you know, some Ubers and taxis and stuff. It was basically the only cars out. Was it a surreal experience for you? I mean, I know you said it wasn't quite what you thought, but what, when you got there, were you, did you kind of have a insight into what, hey, this is a real deal, this is a real problem? I mean, we hadn't quite seen yeah. it in Iowa yet at that point. Yeah, it was April, you know, so we didn't really know what to expect. So at that time, I thought it was um, kind of expecting the worst. To be honest, and in many ways it was, especially for uh, people in New York, you know. Um, but people out there were working really hard. Um, they, like I said, they had enough uh, docs. Um, I think that they were a little bit short on some nursing care and some stuff like that. So were you putting in IVs and a central line? Um, yeah, well, I, I would go like around in the ICU with one of the ICU staff, and then they had you know one uh, resident there that was kind of covering that ICU. So I would kind I kind of helped her out throughout the day, and then what they had us doing uh, was on like an intubation team. Okay. So they would. Uh, there's a lot of patients that need to be intubated, so they would just call over the intercom, like, you know, intubation to whatever floor. And for you, and, that's, that's and second then, nature. Yeah, and that's, then uh, I would respond to that and intubate the patient, and then they would get taken over by that. I was mainly worried if you go in there, you were basically helping lead our COVID task force here, so I was worried <laughs> if we lost a little focus here, you know. I was like, what you know, what are we going to do? There was plenty of uh, yeah. capable people here well, still that could take care of I'm it. I'm sure so. – uh, it was quite, you know, an experience for you, and uh, uh, you probably never forget it. But uh, yeah, I don't think you'll ever, no, won't ever forget it for sure. You know, wish we could have done a little bit, you know, yeah. been a little bit more helpful. But like I said, they were they were doing a really good job out there with a diff- very very difficult situation. So, well, the reason we brought you on today is to discuss, you know, how anesthesia impacts someone's care, you know, perioperative care, the whole thing. Um, and you are one of the leaders at at our surgery center. And, you know, for that part, you know, you take, you're at all of the hospitals that we cover as well in orthopedics. And so um, your group over the last five years, I have seen, you know, change in, in the model a little bit in terms of you've kind of formed some task force focus groups that kind of take a special interest in certain things to kind of lead or an emerging field. Mm-hmm. And not that anything groundbreaking has come up in orthopedics, but we've made some changes, I think, that are worth talking about. Um, and um, one of the big ones in orthopedics is the development of regional anesthesia over the last, say, 10, 15 years. Uh, can you speak to that a little bit? Um, and, and how do you talk to a patient? What does regional anesthesia mean, and how does that impact their care on the day of surgery? Sure. So um, I trained at the University of Iowa and uh, was does a ton of regional anesthesia, so basically nerve blocks to kind of numb uh, different different nerves depending on what uh, part of the uh, patient what part of the body the patient's getting operated on um so we were doing a ton when i was in residency and um so a lot of the guys uh, trained there were pretty became pretty adept at uh, doing those what's changed at oosc in the last 
you know, five, seven years is now we've kind of developed a regional, having a dedicated person to do those uh, nerve blocks. Um, so what we'll do is the patient comes in and if they're scheduled for a nerve block for let's say a rotator cuff surgery or a hand surgery, uh, we'll take that patient to um, and do that block ahead of time before we go into the operating room, um, which is kind of, I think, streamlined the whole process. And we're doing a lot more nerve blocks. A lot of the, you know, the younger guys coming out of training now are very, very um, familiar are, and comfortable doing nerve blocks. Are there well. newer techniques being developed, or is it just the comfort level to kind of uh, push into new boundaries, push past boundaries we previously had? You know, it seems like there's all these new fancier blocks that come out that, hey, this can spare – you know, uh, the quadriceps muscle, for example, on an ACL, which is a big deal. Um, so, you know, yeah, a couple, uh, some newer nerve blocks as um, but in addition then just using ultrasound, Mm -hmm. but that's been, you know, that's been around for a while. Um, I think using ultrasound has made those blocks maybe a little bit more effective. Um, And ultrasound allows you to see the needle and the nerve or bundled nerves that you're blocking right so kind of real time and you can see that see the nerve like you said and then see your needle get real close to those nerves as we inject the local anesthetic that surrounds those nerves have you ever had a nerve block yourself no okay. well I, in training we'd have at iowa was uh, you know like i said was one of the places that did a lot of uh, work with regional anesthesia and you'd they'd let, have you'd let people block you um yeah if you, you, you could volunteer to uh to be a model for the nerve blocks were you a model i did i mean i got i got the needle poke, but they didn't inject local anesthetic, so I wasn't numb. Okay. But, yeah. Well, so, uh, I mean, so you have, you know, a lot of things we do, they say, well, is it going to hurt? And and honestly, when I'm doing a shoulder injection, I kind of know from patients' experiences, but I've never had a shoulder injection, so I can't really tell them. Well, yeah. So you can actually, so what do you tell a patient who's about to have this done? I tell them that, you know, there's we're going to numb up the skin with some local anesthetic just in the, the skin. I tell them that's going to be like a little pinch and a burn, kind of what it's going to feel like. Um, the nerve block itself is usually not very painful. When we inject that, um, when we inject the local anesthetic, you know, sometimes it's in some tight compartments, um, so you'll feel some pressure and maybe a little pain from that. But usually um, it's not, uh, you know, a super painful procedure. I tell them it's, you know, probably less painful even than the IV start that you had to start the day. Okay. Um, so most can people do really well with it. When, you, when you're doing this, can you give them something to take the edge off a little bit? Yeah, um, a lot of us do give them um, some Versed, which is an anxiolytic, so okay. it kind of makes them less anxious. And okay. and I tell people, even though you may be still talking to us, and you know, and may not remember, you it. may not remember okay. that procedure. Yeah. Well, so. I know I know the value in orthopedics uh, for regional blockade um, uh, is tremendous. Uh, we know that uh, utilization of pain meds post op is almost half if you use regional, um, uh, and and just the patient being able to get home in a comfortable manner uh, and, and not worry about the pain they're experiencing and get settled in at home, that's a big deal. They can get pain meds on board before it returns. Um, but when they actually go to sleep at the time of surgery for you, how does it, how does it help you guide them through their, you know, when they're in the OR and they're asleep? Well, you know, with a lot of the surgeries, um, let's say it's a hand surgery, you know, if the nerve block's going to cover the entire, you know, operation where they're not going to feel anything not be able to move that harm um are then you we keeping them awake then we don't necessarily even go all the way off to sleep with general anesthesia you know a lot of the term that people use will be kind of conscious sedation or twilight or whatever so not necessarily using going all the way off to sleep with general anesthesia and um that allows us to you know kind of wake them up quicker towards the end um the medicine that we use which is propofol uh for the sedation usually um is less risk than nausea and vomiting which is you know beneficial less for risk than what like a general anesthetic, which usually for the general anesthetic, we use anesthetic gas to keep them asleep. And that's a, kind of one of the more common triggers for some nausea and vomiting postoperatively. Okay. So is it guaranteed they won't have nausea and vomiting? Uh, not not guaranteed, but a lot less likely that they're going to have nausea and vomiting. And then, like I said, like we can kind of let them wake up towards the end of the procedure. Um, we take them straight to the second stage of recovery. Um, they're so sitting, they bypass first stage. Bypass first stage. You know, there's no breathing tubes, less risk of sore throat. Um, they're sitting in a chair, eating, drinking, and out of the facility pretty quickly. For some of the procedures that uh, still maybe because of positioning or maybe the block doesn't cover the entire procedure, we'll still go to sleep with general anesthesia. Um, is that then the same as if they didn't have the block, or can you give them less? Yeah, you know, maybe not using as many narcotic pain medicines, which all can you know <coughs> cause that cause some nausea and vomiting as well. Um, so those are some of the benefits. And then, like you said, 
going home with the nerve block, you know, the ride home is mm-hmm. uh, uh, less painful. You kind of get settled in at home, take some oral pain medicines before you go to bed at night. We tell people, I tell them, to kind of depend on the block, but, you know, somewhere in the range of 12 to 24 hours that the block's going to work. And then hopefully by that time they have some oral pain medicines on board, it's kind of worn often. So when someone comes the first day of the OR or whatever, for the OR that day, uh, they're meeting a guy who's going to give them their block and not potentially who's going to put them to sleep, correct? Correct. And that helps streamline things <clears throat> because you have more or less a team of you know, uh, uh, guys and gals that are really, really good at this regional anesthesia. Right. Um, well, and so some days there's 15, 16 blocks. Yeah, I think yeah, today I think we did 17 blocks. And, you know, so the person who does the, the block will come talk to the patient, uh, see them, discuss any questions, concerns, uh, talk with their, get their medical history, make sure they're a candidate for block, and then do the block and kind of report to you know, anesthesiologists who will then take care of them in the operating room. Yeah. It just kind of streamlines it, whereas before, a lot of times for some of these procedures, we were doing the nerve block in the operating room. Um, and I think this is a little bit better situation. Just efficiency purposes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, efficiency, you know, positioning, you know, sometimes in the operating room table. Uh, for some of these blocks we do, you know, you, you may either go up on your side or, you know, I'm sure the patient would rather have you be comfortable in a comfortable environment, <laughs> right, doing the block than feeling yeah. the pressure of hurrying up, getting yeah. someone off to sleep. Exactly, exactly. Uh, surgeons waiting, you know, as you always say, we're always pressure. Yeah, yeah, I mean, always breathing down our necks. <laughs> yeah. going faster. I don't know about that. But. So it seems like, you know, are there any complications you know you put uh, so if you do a shoulder an inner scaling nerve block which is for shoulder surgery let's say um, I mean some people can't even feel their hand and they have very little motor control at that point um, and and we do get some questions you know uh, right. they'll call 14 hours later hey this hasn't worn off and some people don't like that feeling it's right. like a claustrophobic feeling right hey, how, how do you I mean, how do you talk them through this? Like, what what are the stages of the recovery from this block and when it will, you know, does it come off all at once or? Right. So we were tracking this uh, early on. Well, we still call you every patient after uh, post-operatively. Um, Who does? Who calls the, them? Someone from the facility, from OOSC. The we'll next call day? Them. Yeah. Okay. We'll call them the next day to see how they're doing, see what the, if they had any questions, concerns about the nerve block. And if there are, they'll write it down and then uh, I end up usually reviewing those. Uh, the What's biggest, the most common? The biggest complaint that we saw early on was that people didn't know. They'll, they'll say, I didn't know my arm was going to be that numb, or let's say. So it was so, like, it, it worked so well. <laughs> it worked so well, right? So um, what I've started to include, and when I go talk to them about them, I was like, I tell them, I was like, you know, the biggest complaint that we hear about this is, you know, that your arm's going to be really numb. And then the other complaint is that they don't let, like, that sensation kind of pins and needles when it's waking up. Mm-hmm. So kind of like your arm's been asleep. So I try to explain that to them. That is kind of like your arm, if you've been lying up for a long time, and that pins and needle sensation. And that will take some time to wear off, you know, a couple hours, and that will go away. So I try to counsel them well on both of those things. Um, as far as other complications of nerve block, there, you know, there are. Um, Can you get any permanent nerve damage? Yes. The risk is very, very small, you know, one in a few thousand. Um, fortunately, we haven't had uh, any of those that I know of. We've had some that have had some lingering either numbness or tingling after a nerve block, um, and then in which case we follow those up and we've had them see neurologists. And when they've even, when they start track these long-term, um, you know, in, in studies and stuff, you know, the majority, if not all these nerve injuries um, will go away over time. Um, there are some patients where that might be a little bit higher risk and we'll, we talk to those patients about them and sometimes uh, decide not to do not to do the block because okay. of those reasons. So, Tell me about, uh, let's switch gears from outpatient, or this could still be outpatient to be honest, but um, like for, for a total knee replacement right. and a spinal. Well, it seems like there's been some change recently, some evolution in maybe what's, what's the cocktail used for the spinal uh, in an outpatient setting maybe versus an inpatient setting. And, and, and uh, just tell our audience kind of like w- what's being taken into consideration there. So uh, um, in the last, you know, we've started doing outpatient total joints there at OOC in the last uh, few years, mm-hmm. and uh, volume's increasing. <coughs> we've always kind of thought for total joints, a, a, you know, you can do either a spinal, which is, a, you know, a local anesthetic shot in the, in the back, which makes you numb. Both you know, sides. Both sides, lower extremities, yeah. And it lasts a couple hours. We've always thought, in the, and a lot of the literature will show that, you know, maybe a spinal's, yeah, 
maybe better than a general anesthetic for total joints for a number of reasons, whether that's decreasing blood loss. Um, Why is it decreased blood loss? Well, it kind of vasodilates uh, the blood vessels and maybe lowers the blood pressure a little bit, so there's less blood loss and less Mm -hmm. risk of transfusion. Um, Maybe helps with decreasing uh, pulmonary complications because obviously you're not putting in a breathing tube. Um, And uh, and then blood clots in the leg, too. So there's reasons, you know, that's debated and trying to decide if the spinal is better. But anyways, I'd say we do 90, 95, probably 95% of our total joints with the spinal. In the outpatient setting, uh, what we want is for those, you know, that spinal to wear off fairly quickly after surgery. So, uh, obviously, so they can get home. So they can move they their can legs, mobilize. they can get up, they can mobilize. Yeah. Uh, I think, you know, a lot of them are doing physical therapy and walking, you know, the same day. Uh, so we've, we've, we've changed uh, to the type of local anesthetic that we're using uh, for the inpatient or for the outpatient total joints. Um, and it's a, What's the acting time on that half-life? Uh, you know, like I've I've done a fair amount here, and a lot of my patients are kind of wiggling their toes uh, towards the end of the as as we're putting on the dressings and yeah. coming out of the operating room. So, so you maybe, have to have so that's a that's a pretty good example of trust between anesthesia and surgery. There, correct? Yeah, you got to know. You need, <laughs> you need to know your orthopedic surgeon, <laughs> you, and uh, you need to know this isn't going to be a four hour operation. You need yes. I More mean, in that case, there's <laughs> always you know that if. If the nerve block, we would never obviously let a patient be back there and uncomfortable. And if, if they're moving too much, we can always convert mm-hmm. over to a general anesthetic if needed. Mm-hmm. Um, but, um, you know, the, like you said, the trust between the anesthesiologist and the surgeons and most of us have been working together for a long time. So we kind of know how long it's going to take right. unless something, you know, unforeseen happens. Um, so it's been working out well. Um, I think most of the patients are doing well. Again, we have, there's a total joint coordinator here at OSC that tracks all that kind of stuff. Um, as far as pain control, mobilization, and stuff, and yeah. it's, you know, it seems to be working well. Good. Good. Um, so, you know, that that brings me into, you know, kind of my next question uh, uh, about uh, you're saying, you know, nausea is a big deal. Like, can you? Is there anything patients can do pre-op? You know, uh, all these things you do in regional anesthesia can help with preventing nausea. That mm-hmm. seems like the biggest complaint, other than pain after surgery. Like, what? What can they do themselves? Can they control anything heading into surgery? Yeah. Whether it's proven in literature or anecdotally <laughs> from your own experiences, what do you? I don't know about either one of those things. I mean, there's things that we do um, to try to prevent What do you nausea. do? So um, hydration, you know, being well hydrated. So some people, I'll, I'll give them a little more fluid if they need to. There's certain. Uh, Who gets a scopolamine patch? I give it to people who've had a prior history of nausea and vomiting with surgery. What's the downside in giving it to everyone? Uh, well, it can cause a dry mouth. In some elderly people, it can cause some confusion, uh, potentially. Okay. Uh, there's risk of some uh, you know, uh, problems with urination in elderly men. Um, but, uh, so that, but so I'll give it to people who've had a prior history or if they have uh, uh, get motion sick. You know, a lot of times people use scopolamine on cruises or, you know, uh, if they – get motion sick anyway so i'll give it to those patients and then other medicines that medicines that we can use we give some decadron some zofran um there's a handful of others that we can use as well avoid in general anesthetic <coughs> sorry is this basically the uh cocktail that people go to after they have a hangover <laughs> you see these hydration <laughs> centers i mean is this more or less what they're doing there is there, uh, is there any uh you know, secret those, sauce in those places <laughs> there's no secret sauce in those places besides IV fluids, really. That's probably what they're giving in some so frame. You don't think there's some Tordal in there or? Um, I don't know if that, that'd be for pain control, to, you know, kind of cure the headache or whatever, but I don't know exactly what they include in right. all those. Okay. So. All right. You can't speak to that. I'm not, I'm not trying all to right. run one of those clinics myself. Fair enough. Sorry. <laughs> and if, you. if someone's, so, it, you know, there's been movies made about you know, fear of going undergoing anesthesia and being awake and not being able to relay to someone you're awake and you're feeling things. You, when you mentioned your spinal's wearing off, you see someone moving. That patient's not awake at that point. They're, motor-wise, they can move and wiggle, but they're, they're going to have no recollection of moving. Is Correct. that fair to say? Or um, So <clears throat> with a spinal, usually most of the time then we're doing some conscious sedation too. So I tell people, with conscious sedation, like a colonoscopy. Are they basically taking a nap? Basically taking a nap. And, but I tell them, you know, there's a chance you could hear things, chance you could remember things, 
chances are you won't care with those. Most people don't. But if people start moving and start waking up with conscious sedation, then we can always kind of give a little bit more either propofol or Versed or whatever. The What people are concerned about, and sometimes people don't know the necessarily know the difference between being a general anesthetic and uh, or they'll tell me hey I woke up during my surgery last time and I'm like oh what did you have done and they'll say well I had my wisdom teeth that came out or I had a, it was my colonoscopy well yeah that's conscious sedation that's you know or the wisdom teeth would be like with nitrous or whatever so that's possible right and people just maybe don't necessarily understand the difference it's very very uncommon to wake up uh, under a general anesthetic and actually be aware and, and uh, remember and remember it that being said, it, it does happen. There's some higher risk types of surgeries or scenarios where that can happen, but very, very rare. Okay. Um, one of the biggest points of uh, uh, contention among patients, you know, is this NPO, right? Uh, NPO meaning nothing to eat or drink, essentially. But clarify this rule for me. <laughs> we, we, want, we want people to not eat or drink after 12 p.m., correct? Right. But clear what liquids are acceptable up until. Uh, well, our society, uh, you know, says till two hours. Two hours before. So two hours until that. But sometimes it's just cleaner to tell people, yeah. don't 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 have the black coffee because they'll right. think coffee may not count, right? Right. What? So clear liquids, you know, is actually clear liquids. So water and you know Gatorade. It's not coffee would be considered <coughs> clear liquid. Tea with, but not tea with sugar and milk and which most people put in there. So, so why is uh, why is why is Gatorade acceptable, but then, you know, tea with sugar and all this stuff isn't? What's the difference? Well, it has to do with, like, the <coughs> consistency and what's all involved. And, you know, there's studies on, like, how fast your stomach will empty that. So our concern is aspiration. So, like, some of the stomach contents coming up and getting down to your lungs, which is, you know, is always a and, risk. With and that usually happens when you're inducing... Right. Yeah, after you, when you go to sleep, or you've lost some of your protective airway reflexes with you know with conscious sedation. So um, that's what we d we're trying to avoid with those MPO guidelines. Um, that's when your job goes from cruise control to right panic. Yeah, not not, pa not panic. You know what to do, but it's an aspiration is obviously something you're trying to avoid. Very, very you know, very, very uncommon, but it does happen on occasion and. You know, so if we would like, ideally on elective surgeries to have a, you know, kind of an empty stomach if, if possible. So. So your <laughs> message to patients would be, don't lie about what you've had. <laughs> I mean, how, what I'm guessing you've had seen people that you know lied, and egg, oh, eggs come up or. I'm sure. Yes. You know. Yeah. I mean, I've, I, you know, haven't been involved in it. You know, having done this for ten years, you know, I've had some aspiration events, and whether they whether they lied or. You know, usually those scenarios are also like some sort of trauma or whatever that, you know, we don't have time for to have mm -hmm. an MPO guideline in, in advance, you know. So, um, but. So that makes your job a little more difficult if they're uh, not adhering. But but I think most people with elective surgery, I mean, they're, in, they're interested in that day being a success. And yeah. are, are we changing? Um, I don't know if we're there yet, but are we looking into potentially some type of energy Supplement or whatever it may be to help with dehydration or blood glucose control after surgery. Well, there's a lot of a lot of talk in the, in the literature and uh, within different uh, programs now about they call it enhanced recovery after surgery. And one of those is it's a it's a lot of different things that would get, go into those uh, protocols. One of those would be um, changing those MPO at least a, you know it, it entice it or having the patients continue to eat or not eat, but drink up until two hours before, so they don't come in in a dehydrated, like unfed state. Okay. And there are there are certain uh, drinks that are acceptable, but again, like right now, those are only certain drinks. And right now, we're still a little hesitant on what the you know telling patients to have anything because never knowing what they what they might take. It'd just be so, easiest if they didn't. It, it's not terribly difficult if you're first case, but if you're in the afternoon, yeah, you know, you're all of a sudden fasting when you weren't intending to fast, but. right? All right, so let's get into, you know, what what are the most common fears you hear from patients? I mean, anesthesia is some I have a lot of patients that are much more fearful of the anesthesia than they are of the surgery. Uh, do, you, do you hear all these fears? Do they ask you, do you have any, um, well, I mean, there has to be some crazy questions you've been asked over the years and some myths that you've debunked. Right. <clears throat> so I think the biggest one is we kind of touched on a little bit is like, am I going to wake up um, during this? Yeah. And 
you know, I can tell them pretty confidently that you're, you're not, not going to happen. You're not going to, you're not going to wake up. You're not going to remember this. Oh, pain control's a big one. Uh, you know, am I going to wake up in pain? We talked a little bit about nerve blocks as far as, you know, not all surgeries can we do nerve blocks for, but you know, we get pain medicines throughout the surgery, try to provide, you know, we've kind of changed into a lot of, a lot of multi, what we call multimodal. So a lot of different avenues to try to control pain, you know, NSAIDs, uh, Tylenol, non-narcotic pain medicine, that kind of stuff as well. Yeah. For me, so, it's people are worried about, you know, where their cell phone's going in that <laughs> plastic bag, you know, am I going to see that again? Or, um, but, uh, yeah, it's a nerve-wracking day for patients, no doubt. And to have uh, an anesthesiologist, the quality of yourself and your groups is a big deal. And it, it seems like there's a, a decent amount of collaboration in this town, no matter what specialty it is, uh, with you guys. Uh, it's interesting. You can ask any one of the guys in your group, you know, about a surgeon they're working with, and they'll know, like, the three or four main points, you know, like – uh, what 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 kind of their habits are you know what their uh, speed is what kind of music they listen to in the OR right I mean do you guys have cliff notes on this stuff or is this just a memory <laughs> bank you fall away and- it's kind of funny like when I showed up when I came to, to this job seven years ago like my first month or maybe even two months a little bit longer whatever every night I would call one of the senior partners in my group I was like hey I'm working with so-and-so tomorrow what do I what do I expect yeah. or how do I, you know, what do we, what do they like? What do they dislike? That kind of stuff. And, um, so after you kind of figure that out, then you kind of, you kind of know, um, cause everyone's a little bit different, you know, for the most you part. You have a Rolodex, you start, you know, no, like, not, oh, okay, not. Sullivan tomorrow again. <laughs> no, I can't take the EDM music. Just call a partner and change out that if that's the case. Yeah. You just switch out. Yeah, hey, you switch out. Can't do it. Can't do it again. Like, can we not do one, this? Once a month. <laughs> Is that the, yeah, that's probably your threshold. I would guess. No, we have a good time in the OR. I think um, when you take care of your end of things and you know everyone around you is taking care of things, then uh, it, it leads to, like, this fun environment. It's hard to describe unless you've been there, you know? Yeah. Um, like, for people to think you, you listen to music in the OR, that's crazy. You know, it should be everything should be super intense. Right. Um, you know, a, a lot of what we do is should be reproducible, uh, should be second nature. The thought process a lot of times should be done ahead of time as it is for me I'm sure it is for you when you're pre op in a patient you see them you kind of you eyeball them you know what their meds are you know how we're going to attack this thing and so then when you're in there um, it's a pretty collegial fun environment I think right you know we do this every day multiple times a day um, and then I think you know for patients you know this might be their first surgery second surgery and I guess that's one of the biggest things I can kind of remember when I wanted to go into the anesthesia was my uncle being like you know that like surgery is a big deal for a lot of people, you know, mm-hmm. there's like one of the most stressful things. In their, it's maybe, a huge deal. Maybe one of their most stressful times in their life. And it's like, you're going to be one of the last piece of persons they see before they go off to sleep. And then, um, and you can, you can do a lot to kind of, you know, help with that fear or anxiety, you know, if, just based on how you talk to them and what you, you know, and how you interact with them right before that. So, um, again, you know, but then once we're in there, then we're, you know, they're, they're taken care of. And then yeah. it's like the things that this is just what we do. They're every comfortable day. and we just take care of it. Yeah. Uh, everyone says, oh, you know, the, the medicine you inject puts them to sleep burns. Does it actually burn? <laughs> yeah, it, it, it does. It I does, mean, it, but how, how do you, if you don't remember that it burned, did it actually burn? <laughs> Cause anyone ever remembered it burning? Uh, well, I've had surgery a couple of times and, and I, I have, I have remembered it. You do, it. but you know, there's things we can that we try to do. To it, some of it depends on the the patient. Some of it depends on the size of the IV. You know, mm-hmm. um, we try to do different things, like putting some lidocaine or numbing medicine in that uh, propofol or, in, or into that IV beforehand to decrease the burning. Again, not everyone has a, yeah. a bad reaction. Uh, uh, it's not even a bad reaction, but some people, you know, just like with everything, everyone's a little bit different, but. Um, some people have more, more pain than others. I, I will say, you know, I've never, I've never heard anyone complain of that in clinic. But and most people tell me that all they remember is warm blankets being placed on them. Yeah. And then that was it. So smooth sailing. Mm-hmm. But um, we really appreciate you coming on. You know, sometimes uh, you take for granted the things that you guys do that streamline the process. And I know at DMOS we really appreciate your group, uh, your collegiality, and, and working towards a common goal. And I know it's ended up with better patient results. So thanks again for coming on. Great place to work. Appreciate you having me on. Yep, got it. Thanks for listening to Joint Effort, a podcast from Des Moines Orthopedic Surgeons. If you have questions about this podcast, 
and wish to schedule an appointment with the surgeon, call 515-224-1414 or visit dmos.com.